it is a thematic day to talk about uh, nature and land use and the oceans. So with our panelists today, we're going to take a little time not to think about um, the human impact on humanity, but um, the human impact on everything on this planet that is not us, and how nuclear energy can in fact help with us this. So I'm going to introduce our panelists one by one, and uh, I'm going to ask them to share with us uh, maybe a, a fact or something about um, how nuclear energy can help uh, with uh, preserving nature uh, as we are also trying to reduce uh, climate change. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Suniva Rose. She is a nuclear physicist from Norway. Sunika, can you share with us a fact about nuclear energy and how uh, it can help with saving uh, nature and preserving non-human populations on this planet? Well, in addition to being um, emission-free or with the lowest emissions in life cycle analysis, is, uh, nuclear is also the most energy-dense form of energy that we have. And that is a problem with the renewables, that they are very, uh, very little energy-dense. Nuclear, however, is the most energy dense. And the most important thing we can do to preserve nature is to not touch it. So if we, I mean, the, the least we have to do with nature, the, the better. And that's why nuclear is a very, very, um, yeah, nature-friendly energy source. Uh, very important. I think the density of nuclear is exactly what attracted me to nuclear energy uh, for the sake of humanity, but it it's also has the effect of sparing nature. And now we're going to move on to Julia Galosz from Poland, who is a board member for the pro-nuclear group FOTA for Climate. Julia, thank you for joining us, and can you share uh, how um, nuclear energy can help with the preservation of nature? So I think the first thing that we need to consider in terms of like helping nature is like obviously not touching it but also in terms of uh, like long term investments we need to decarbonize as quickly as possible in terms of climate change so we can carbon stock in the forests or wetlands and this is the natural way of leaving this uh, basically coal in the planet and it's untouched when we are building like solar farms or wind farms, we are usually destroying this natural bank of carbon if it's built in the place like forest. We need to cut it down and eventually do something with the wood. So I think that's, that the best way to uh, protect the nature is like, as you said, actually, you know, I, I don't want to, to what, don't, don't know what to tell more because that's the best way to protect the nature, to just leave it alone. And uh, the scientists, they say that we should leave almost half of our planet untouched. And if we want to decarbonize with only renewables, if we would like to do that, it would be impossible to leave the half of our planet untouched. We also have humanity. We also have agriculture. And we can't afford to cover the almo almost whole surface with, of our planet with renewables. So that's why we also have to invest in nuclear. Well, that, that's a very good point. I haven't thought about the soil disturbances that can come with building out renewable energy, which is, of course, a very good and necessary low carbon source. But as Julia said, we are going to try and leave half the area of our earth alone, we have to find some way of freeing up the land. Next, we're going to introduce um, Christian Barnard, who is a conservative for conservation. He, in fact, is the president of the American Conservative Co Conservation Coalition, is that correct? And um, I, Christian, why don't you uh, say hello to everybody and share with us maybe a surprising fact about how nuclear can um, can help us with preserving the, the environment. Sure, well, since you said uh, to say hello, hello everyone. <laughs> um, it's great to be here with you all and with such um, e eloquent nuclear activists. Uh, I think the, the most important thing that gets lost in the energy conversation around the world is just the idea that every single energy source has trade-offs, not just 
fossil fuels, not just nuclear, but also renewables. When you think about the fact that for coal, you have to get it out of the, the, the earth, you need to mine it. For oil and gas, you need to frack it or drill it. Um, for nuclear, you obviously need to get the uranium. Um, but then for wind and solar, you also need to get the materials to build uh, wind, uh, wind turbines and solar panels. But then you also need the land to site it. And so it's not just about the affordability of energy. It's not just about the reliability of energy or about the emissions of energy. It's also about the land usage and the, the impact on uh, the earth, the physical footprint of each source of energy. And honestly, the, the reason I love nuclear so much and I come at it from a conservationist perspective is I think a lot of people, when they think about the environment, they have this instinctive love for the outdoors. And that's why a lot of us care about these issues. And we want to have the least amount of human impact on the beautiful spaces that we all love, right? Um, and we were just talking about like how much more physical space and land, wind and solar take than a nuclear plant, just to put some numbers on that. Mm -hmm. um, for the same amount of space that one single nuclear plant takes, you need 50 times that land for solar energy and, and up to 400 times that for wind turbines. And so if you think about the amount of electricity you need in the world mm -hmm. to be able to meet our decarbonization goals, but not ruin nature at the same time, you need to be able to have sources like nuclear that you said are the most energy dense so that we're uh, protecting the planet through emissions reductions, but also through uh, reducing our physical footprint on the land. And I think those numbers are really stark and that's something that we should be doing a lot more to engage traditional conservation groups on you should be supporting nuclear because that's more land to hike. That's more land for uh, wildlife refuges. That's that's. That's more land that we can protect because it should be protected and we should not be using that. Great, thank you so much, Christian. And now we'll move on to Tia Tormanen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I, she's, she's finished. She's the international coordinator for the um, advocacy organization, Replanet. And um, I, I'm sure she'll love to share with you a interesting fact about how nuclear can save the climate, I mean, the nature. Hello everyone, uh, Replanet is an environmental global network and uh, we believe technologies can be solutions, not problems, and that's why we are pro-nuclear, pro-gene editing, pro process implementation, for example. Um, in the 80s, when I you know, became an environmentalist as a child, um, climate change, I mean, it was talked about, but not as much, so I came into environmentalism from uh, the, the biodiversity perspective, so we were talking about rainforests and, and stuff like that and I'm a biologist as well. And so why I th always thought nuclear was a good idea, because it has a very small land use footprint. Uh, people come to me uh, when I talk about nuclear, asking about what about mining, for example. And when I tell them that nuclear actually requires less mining than solar and wind, they're like, wow. Uh, because they think mining is a problem from nuclear. And I, I always say that if you don't like mining and the impacts of mining, then you su should advocate for nuclear. And this is very surprising to people. And I just recently visited uh, Olkiluoto 3 plant in Finland, which is the newest uh, nuclear power plant that we have. And it was amazing to see that on this tiny island, you can walk through it in maybe like 15 minutes, we have three nuclear plants. They produce 30% of our electricity in Finland in just this tiny island. And it's surrounded by nature. They actually have like a nature paths going around there and there's swans swimming in front of the, the nuclear plant. Nothing coming out of the plant, no pollution, nothing. It's amazing. So that's why I support nuclear. Great. And finally, we, we have Jens Christensen. He's a physics student and he's from Denmark. Tell me why nuclear for nature? Yeah, so I, there are several different ways that you can get into nuclear energy just because it's freaking awesome uh, It's carbon neutral and all these things But I think one of the things that is really overlooked is the tiny tiny land footprint that it has It's like one of the most important aspects of nuclear energy So I'm from Denmark and we are really big on renewable energy, but what I think is kind of a an overlooked aspect of this whole talk is that um, renewable energy is like this um, really great harmonic thing that we harvest the natural resources of this planet. But what that means essentially behind 
like the curtain is that we have to industrialize nature in order to harvest these things. Um, so we have to industrialize nature and that harms nature a lot if we actually do this. So I think we need to talk about this more. And the thing about nuclear energy is that it, it, it is free of this. You don't industrialize nature by building nuclear energy. So I had the pleasure of visiting Baraka, the new nuclear power plant here in the Emirates. It can produce more electricity than my entire country consumes in a year, which is just mind-blowing. And um, you can walk around it. It takes maybe 30 minutes to walk around the whole power plant. It produces more electricity than my entire country consumes. If you, if you really like get that in your mind, then you can really see like the benefits of nuclear in terms of saving nature and also saving the climate at the same time, because these things are interconnected. We should not be destroying nature while trying to save it. Can, yeah, please, please. I, I just want to emphasize, because we've been talking about the area use and the density, because that's really one of the really important things that it comes down to. But just to be clear, unless the audience are not aware, we're not just talking about, I mean, when we're doing this, if we are to compare the different energy sources, we, of course, we can't just look at the area where we actually build the power plants. So when we're talking about that, it's small. It's not just actually where the power plant is built, but this is including also the what you would do to nature to do the mining, to build the roads, mm -hmm. everything that you do, and also eventually to commission the plant. And when you do these life cycle analysis, is nuclear is the absolute, I mean, it does the least to nature. So just to be clear, it's not just the power plant. Yes, it's, it's very important to remember because we're all like been talking about this a lot within our communities. But to, I think uh, quite often it's a narrative out in the wider world that we have to change. I feel like people do automatically draw an equal sign between solar and wind and uh, being good for nature and being in harmony with nature but somehow nuclear even though um, as discussed it is the densest form of power and therefore we can spare the maximum amount of nature by not using that area uh, somehow it still has this image problem do you do you guys find that out in the wild I mean out in the wild amongst us humans in the concrete jungle, that perception. And uh, what do you think we can do to try and shift that? Because I think all of us here probably are interested in nuclear, are not surprised. Who here, show of hands, who here is surprised by the fact that nuclear is the densest uh, form of uh, energy, clean energy generation? I don't think anybody is. We all know this, we're talking to the choir, but how can we break this perception out in the wider world? Anybody can, can take this question. Oh, Chris Christian. I think part of the problem has been in mainstream depictions and culture around nuclear. You see, like for example, in The Simpsons, oh, nu a nuclear plant is next to a lake and the lake is full of three-eyed fish because of all the nuclear green sludge that's pouring into the lake. I think we've done a really bad job at pushing back against that narrative and showing, like, actually, that's completely unscientific. That's not true. Um, I think the other thing is a lot of people, when they look at a nuclear plant and they see all the white stuff coming out the top, they think, wow, that's pollution, right? Whereas we actually all know that's water vapor. Um, and so I think we just need to be able to uh, show images of, like, the footprint of a nuclear plant for example, like on your island, right? Like if you can show like a, an aerial view of like, look, there's this beautiful island and there's nuclear plants there and it's actually uh, such a small footprint and it's a huge part of your el electricity in the country. I think we just need to use images to, to help change people's minds. Um, but then also like if you look at a lot of the next generation nuclear technologies, like for example, Oklo has like this really cool graphic of what their, uh, what their reactor is gonna look like. It looks like a hut in a forest. Mm -hmm. Like it looks really cool. And people look at that and they say like, oh, that actually like it's harmonious with nature. I, so I, I think we can do more to change the images and the industry can help show that the, this next generation is actually like working with nature rather than against I, it. I have an interesting um, anecdote to share about that because the Oklo reactor is actually supposed to be mostly below ground. So literally like that hut in nature, it could be absolutely anything. <laughs> so in that way, it's not that representative. But then I realized, actually, it doesn't matter. This is the kind of work we need to be doing to 
um, communicate to the public that actually uh, nuclear can be in sync, in step with nature. And I think Taya will had something to add. Yeah, so I actually See. took a picture of the Oak Little Island with the swans swimming in front of it, and I did publish it in social media, and people were very excited about that and sharing that image. It was very popular. It was like, wow, that looks amazing. And we don't even have the cooling towers, so <laughs> don't have the vapor coming out. Um, so it was just amazing and people said that that's so beautiful and, and, and I put the, the, you know, like how much electricity it process produces and yes, we need to be sharing those images. Um, when it comes to three-eyed fish, um, I mean, usually I get also a lot of questions about Chernobyl mm -hmm. and what people don't know, it's a thriving uh, biodiversity area right now. It's a nature conversation, conversation, hmm. conservation area. And it has like one of the most thriving wolf populations, for wow. example, wild horses, everything. And we need to be showing this. And it's because of human absence mm -hmm. that this place has this. So our absence is more devastating to environment than a nuclear accident, that the worst in history. Because we're not messing with anything there and the nature can just be there. And so the populations there, are animal populations are thriving. Well, that, that's really ironic that uh, a, a human... Um, nuclear disaster have ironically allowed nature to thrive by removing our presence. Um, I just, before we move on to Sonova, I just want to add one thing, which is that also in Fukushima, you get this thriving nature all around the exclusion zone because there are no humans there. And scientists have actually set up cameras, I believe, like video cameras so you can actually see for yourself. So that's something really cool, and I suggest you all check it out. And now we'll move to Sonova. Yeah, because you also see the same thing around the Bikini Atolls. Uh, so when, when human disappeared, nature, nature eventually thrives. And that shows us at least two things. One is that, yeah, human interference is the worst to nature. So back to what we started at. I mean, if you want to preserve nature, leave it alone. That's an important part. But another thing is that it's also a hopeful one because it shows that even when we have tried or tried really hard to destroy it, if we leave it alone, it actually restores. And that's, I think that's a very, that's a happy story. But back to your um, original question, it's, it's a hard one. Like, how do we, how do we get people on board? And I think we have to remember that the ones that are, um, the numbers people, the engineering minds, they are more with us uh, to begin with because they, they sort of, they look at numbers and they say, okay, so the numbers are this and then that's fine. But if we, if we then keep our sort of engineering and scientist mind and try to communicate just the numbers, I don't think that really will help because then we are only talking to the ones that are already with us. We have to remember that people are people and we are different and some of us are more, uh, we... <laughs> We, we don't look at the numbers, we are yeah. more like fe emotional beings. And I think that, so th that's back to what you also said, that's more about telling stories and engaging with people and respecting people and respecting people's fears because the reason why they are scared, like for example after Fukushima, might not be a real reason, but their fear is still as real as if it was a good reason. I think to so respecting people is an important point. Yeah, it, it, is, it is interesting that uh, I want to talk about coding. Technology is neutral. Uh, um, uranium is neutral. But certain things in our culture get coded as left wing, right wing, in, out. Um, and I, I'm afraid that somehow even nuclear um, uses very little land and actually allows nature to be wild. Somehow it has been coded as industrial and it has been coded as anti-nature and uh, hyper hyper um, human development so I'm, I'm just wondering what we can do to shift that and in fact um, so many of the mainstream environmental organizations uh, chief of which um, it's most famous let's say is Greenpeace are still anti-nuclear how can we um, how can we reach out to them and change that fact? And again, this question is for everybody. 
I think there's a different problem with that because, you know, as humans, of course, we make mistakes and it's it's important to say, okay, I was wrong and that's everything is fine with that. And, you know, during our life, we make so many mistakes almost every day sometimes that that's, it's normal. But it's really hard to say I was wrong, especially after such a long time till like 70s, if I'm not wrong, Greenpeace was advocating against nuclear. So right now They're it's still, really difficult. Still now, aren't they <laughs> against nuclear? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's I think it's really difficult for them to mm -hmm. say, okay, last almost 50 years of our career, we were wrong. And I don't know why, because you know, in if they would change their mind, they can still like change the whole narrative about the nuclear from their perspective mm -hmm. and they have access to a huge number of activists and advocates for environment so they could possibly have huge impact for the case but unfortunately for now they are not changing their mind fortunately they are not for example in poland advocating as much against nuclear so mm -hmm. maybe something mm -hmm. is changing we will see i will keep my fingers crossed for that but it's really easy you know for the average citizen to associate knowledge and technology with something destroying the nature and something like you know after the movies and the robots taking over the world yes. and everything we have something like that in our mind if we would think about like an average citizen of the world they prefer to think that we can charge everything from the wind and from the sun and from the water it's so natural it's mm -hmm. so beautiful romantic you know way of producing energy but we have to also create this emotional story because most of the people are working with emotions not not with numbers so we have to story tell we have to make this narrative change this narrative because you know we have the numbers we just have to build the story around it that that is a very interesting point but it but all is not hopeless because even though greenpeace worldwide and the uh, world wildlife fund and a lot of those uh, environmental conservation organizations are still anti nuclear unfortunately there is some change i i believe it's it is in finland isn't it where the greenpeace have declared a kind of truce with nuclear yeah, so in Finland, um, Greenpeace does not campaign against nuclear. Actually, they've said very nice things about nuclear. Like when Old Little 3 came online, they s said that they're wishing the best of luck for the plant and they're actually considering SMRs for district heating. And uh, the leader of the Nordic Greenpeace, uh, who was formerly the leader of the Finnish Greenpeace, said that she doesn't believe that we can achieve net zero targets without nuclear. Wow. So there has been huge process progress in Finland and the climate youth in Finland inc including Fridays for Future for mm -hmm. example are pro nuclear they even published a public statement when when uh, Greta Thunberg came out saying that she thinks that nuclear shouldn't be in the taxonomy they um, made a public statement saying that Fridays for fin Future Finland thinks that nuclear should be in the taxonomy mm -hmm. not not gas but nuclear should be in so in Finland we've and the Green Party in Finland I'm also in the Green Party is pro nuclear so we have changed the whole environmental scene in Finland, and so it's possible in other countries as well. I, I think you said something really interesting earlier about the wolves, um, like in Chernobyl, and like just the nature and the animals. Because I remember the first time I ever gave money to uh, a nonprofit organization was when I was eight, and I gave 20 euros, I was living in Belgium at the time, to WWF. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason was because I, I loved animals so much. Yeah. And I, put up your hand if that's why you started caring about nature. Because <laughs> yeah. cute animals and just seeing like all these, uh, like whether it was polar bears or wolves or whatever it might be. I think especially when you're growing up, that's why you relate to nature. And maybe that's something that the nuclear in industry could be doing a lot better of is like start producing um, like images of nuclear plants with thriving wildlife around it. Like we see Diablo Canyon in California, there's sea lions off the coast thriving. You see wolves around Chernobyl, you see swans in Finland, you see all these nuclear plants across the world where you have thriving wildlife. Maybe our imagery that we should be using um, as pro-nuclear activists, as the industry, looking at you David, like maybe we should put animals back into that and show that actually like being pro-animal and being pro-nuclear are not just possible, it's like mutually inclusive with one another. 
if I may add something to that, you know, the fresh research from a few days ago says that uh, like solar panels, they affect bats in terms of uh, like the feeding area, you know, and if we don't have solar panels because we have, for example, I, I don't want to be a hater, you know, I really don't want to be a hater of renewables because they are, we need them in some places, but in other places, where is the nature, for example, we can use only a little of land and leave the rest. And also something that we don't, do not think about is that, or usually we do not think about that, is that when you build nuclear power plant, then it can work and it does not affect at the time of working the environment around. In terms of wind turbines, for example, it's really visible that it affects birds, it affects like even invertebrates, and also the lifespan of renewables is shorter, so we have to build new one and new one and new one and in terms of nuclear power plant it's a really long span of life so i think we, we can show these images and i think this is one of our advantages like in the whole conversation of one more time i don't want to be a hater of renewables i think they are needed but uh yeah but i think we can we can find a place for each energy source in the system that great point i'll, I'll come to you in a minute but i just want to add thank you we have such enthusiastic panelists and that everybody's just like really champing at the bit but i come from taiwan and it is a very, very small island um, compared to the population, which is 23 million. And by the way, um, we also make all the chips that are in your phones, the really good ones. So uh, we really need that low, we need, really need that uh, low carbon power. Um, but uh, we're trying to get off fossil fuels. But it would simply, in my mind, be very impractical to, um, to decarbonize through solar or wind alone because you simply do not have the space. And uh, I think that's one thing to really keep in mind is that the, the world is so geographically um, diverse. A good solution for one country might not be for another. And uh, with that, I'll go to Jans, who also comes from a pretty, s pretty um, small country, although mighty in, in a lot of ways, uh, Denmark. Yeah, so um, I'm from Denmark and it's a really small country. Um, we have like uh, 42,000 square kilometers of land area. And it's really hard for us to not start industrializing that area if we want to make energy with renewables. Mm -hmm. And I think, so I, ha I have a point that I want to make. One of the disadvantages of nuclear is that it is actually so amazing and so energy dense, one nuclear power plant, as I've said before, can supply more than the entire electricity consumption of my entire country. So that is a disadvantage because people don't know about that. Mm -hmm. It's just somewhere out in the middle of the desert. Or if it was in Denmark, it would just be like somewhere. Nobody would even know that it's there. And um, so that's a disadvantage because with wind turbines, for example, everybody sees them everywhere. Yes. They know what it is. They can wrap their mind around like what it is, but people don't know what a nuclear power plant is because it is so small that they don't even see it ever in their entire lifetime. So if you go to France, for example, they're like the biggest producer of nuclear energy per capita. They have like more than 70% of the entire electricity consumption coming from nuclear. Yes. If you ask people from France what nuclear is, they don't, they don't even know what it is because they don't see it either because it's coming from like 50 power plants or less like in their entire country for millions of people so that is a disadvantage for nuclear that it is actually so amazing at sparing nature and we need to be better at communicating this because no one knows what nuclear is they, they don't see it and and we really need to like make this more yeah we need to talk about this more that it is there yes it's it supplying is. clean energy for millions of people and because people don't see like we have to be better at communicating that it's there Suniva? yeah I would just like to add to that because another point there is so people see the wind uh, yes. turbines and they and they understand it because it's like and it is as also you said that it's this romantic idea I mean it, it, it sounds really really good to harvest the energy of the wind and the Sun that's a really really nice idea and you see the, the windmills and you sort of yeah you can understand it this goes around and then you produce energy 
So uh, what I've experienced in more than 10 years that I, as a nuclear physicist, have been talking about what is nuclear energy. I always, even if I'm invited to talk about like how could nuclear be in a Norwegian energy mix, which is really not a nuclear physics question, mm -hmm. but I always insist on spending quite some time about starting with everything is made out of atoms. Every atom has a nucleus. Some of those nuclei, they can fish and explain this. And that, what happens after that, people say, ah, I, I get it. I, so, so I think that's also to, to try, because it's much, it is harder. It is sort of a higher, more technological advance to produce energy by new. So yeah, to talk about what is it. So this demystification, demystification. in a way, I think that is yeah. important also. Not yeah. about nature, but how do we, well, how do we come around with this. I, I, th I think so. And also just to, um, I, I, d I don't know why it is, maybe because of the long, because nuclear waste lasts for a long time, people have this like mistaken idea in their mind that somehow nuclear waste is uniquely polluting compared to everything else that we generate as a part of our industrial process. And for some reason that uniqueness stick in people's mind and they aren't able to put it in context and one way i do want to put it in context is is the scale of w we know that it's denser can anybody tell me like uh for a standard like gigawatt scale nuclear power plant how how much uh solar panels or how much wind turbines will we need to replace that oh, oh. I, I have one number that i tell and that you probably have i mean it's the same basic number but you say it in a different way so what i say is that uh, I, I compare the energy release in the fission reaction mm -hmm. to the chemical energy that you get when you burn something. So I could actually compare it to burning, for example, coal, or it could yes. be anything. So that is a reaction when carbon reacts with oxygen, c producing CO2. So that's even that's more energy dense than the renewables. But even then, you get 50 million times more energy per reaction, 50 million times more. What does that mean in something that we can relate more to? That means that if you take slightly more than one gram of uranium, 1.053 grams of uranium, and you fission all the nuclei, all the uranium nuclei in this one gram, you produce the same amount, or you release the same amount of energy as one Norwegian family of two adults and two kids would use in one year. If you were to burn something, you would need, for example, four tons of coal. So that is what that energy density means. So it's one gram for so that's just the difference in the fission energy and chemical energy. And then you probably, some of you have more the density yeah, in like yeah. land use and stuff. One, um, one uh, data I always like to use, and you guys can fact check me, is uh, a uranium pellet that is roughly the size of a gummy bear uh, represent all the energy that is um, in a ton of coal. So if you can imagine that density, um, you can you can really understand the scale of the power of the atom. But I would love to hear some more facts and figures about how it stacks up against against renewable energy. Uh, well, when it comes to waste, I usually say that you know if all of your energy needs throughout your lifetime would be um, powered by nuclear energy, you would the the amount of waste would be like one Red Bull can. Basically, and people are just wow. That's not much. Like they, th then they can think about like how much waste they're you like producing, just you know, living their daily lives, and comparing that to a Red Bull can. That's a, a that's an image that I like to use quite a bit. Yeah, and uh, Jans. Yeah. So, thank you for that question. I think it's really important to like get the numbers on the table. So, one of my favorite statistics about this thing is um, in Europe last year nine of the northern European countries decided to build 300 gigawatts of offshore wind in the northern sea mm -hmm. so I looked at the numbers and I tried to make up like I don't feel like anybody actually investigated like how much area will this cost so the Danish Energy Agency they have uh, 3.7 megawatts per square kilometer for mm -hmm. offshore wind. If you put that through the 300 gigawatts of offshore wind, that is uh, 86,000 square kilometers. Wow. The entire country of Denmark is 42,000 square kilometers. So it's more than twice the size of Denmark for offshore wind in the Northern Sea, just 
enormous wind turbines. And I don't think anybody considered like what does this actually mean? If you wanted to supply the same amount of energy from nuclear, you could build 30 barracas. Mm -hmm. I went there a couple of days ago. I could walk around it in like 30 minutes yes. or less. 30 of those stations or twice the size of Denmark in offshore wind turbines. Like, that's insane if you actually think about it like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it the is. problem is most people don't think about it. And why would they? I, be, I, I really have a lot of empathy for ordinary people because I didn't used to be in energy. I haven't been in energy all my life. Um, I was a reporter, and before I reported on energy, um, to me it was very abstract. And, and of course, you know, it's like you, you just think, okay, um, solar panels are good, uh, wind turbines are good. And they are good, but when, when compared to the power of, of nuclear, um, most people just, I think, I think they still don't get it. I th and and, and um, that is something that we really have to change. Um, I, I also want to um, talk about... Um, for me, like, uh, again, to have empathy for everyday people who think this way. When I was a little girl, um, the first thing I read about uh, nuclear energy was in a book about um, how once you use a, nu a, a piece of land for a nuclear power plant, you could never use it for anything else ever again. You get to generate power for 40 years, and then that land is, like, forbidden forever. And I remember that was so scary to me. There seems to be something uniquely contaminating about this form of power generation. Um, I still remember, you know, of course now I realize it's completely wrong. You can use a nuclear power plant for above 40 years, um, 80 years, who knows, maybe longer, we don't know yet. And also you can return the land completely to nature and we've done that. Um, but this, this association is so deep in people. I would like to invite our panelists to tell us how can we break that association and uh, reintroduce nuclear as a friend of nature and how can we do it not one at a time but en masse? Okay, so in terms of like the narrative and the response of human beings to that, it's really easy to tell them that something is scary and they will be scared. You know. Each of us, I think, w was a child, so <laughs> we remember that, uh, like, m the feeling when we were scared of something, when the feeling when we were scared of the darkness, or we were scared of ghosts, or anything. You know, we knew that there is nothing to be scared of, but it was really difficult for us to deeply believe that it's really nothing to be scared of. And I think the change in the narrative can be also be like shifted through investments around like the future nuclear power plants or like existing nuclear power plants that are helping actively ha helping the nature. Uh, here, also in Baraka, that, that's quite recent trip, so we are talking about that a lot. But it, it was also a perfect place to see. So in Baraka, they have created artificial coral reef because they have open cooling system so like the citizens were worried that the bill that the investment of in nuclear power plant here will affect the coastal life what did the like power plant man manager let's say i don't know who was that exactly but like, what what did they do is mm, they gave something to the people so the people not only won't be scared about like the change in the level of let's say b diversity of the coastal life but will also be happy about mm -hmm. that because right now they have artificial coral reef that's something amazing that's something to be proud of so i think that's also like something that we should advocate for to think deeply about the local community and their needs mm -hmm. and try to fulfill them, not only fulfill them, but also like give something more. I, I think that that's quite important and we can be proud of investments like that, like in here. Great. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I was going to say, what's interesting in the United States is that data shows that the closer you live to a nuclear plant, the more likely you're, you are to be pro-nuclear. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is that like when you have that proximity to it and you understand it, you're actually very much pro-nuclear. It's difficult not to be. 
And somebody, I, I forget who it was, said something really interesting about how in the public narrative, wind and solar is like, portrayed as this natural thing. Um, and nuclear is seen as this like, uniquely industrializing force. I think we all like know the advertisements you see of like rolling hills with, with mm -hmm. wind turbines yeah. or like the solar panels. Like you see like a, an electric vehicle advertisement on TV and you see like the wind turbines and the solar panels in the background. And like that's very much portrayed as the energy of the future. And I think that's something again that I feel like the nuclear industry could do uh, more on is to show uh, what like this next generation of nuclear technology actually looks like. Wait, we should be putting out ads that show like the nature aspects of nuclear, like the animals around it, like the the Oklo stuff. Like people don't have any image of nuclear beyond like the nuclear plant from The Simpsons and the Three Eyed Fish or the the cooling tower that looks like it's emitting pollution. But we could be like doing those really cool like advertisements and videos that show that actually this is high tech, this is awesome, this is something not to be afraid of, and like start inserting that into the mainstream consciousness of how people think about where their electricity comes from. Y yeah. And it's really weird about when you think that wind and solar are so prevalent in those ads because nuclear in the US is by far the largest source of clean electricity. So it's not like this is a niche thing. Like We should be showing this everywhere because it is providing a lot of energy for a lot of people. And, and it's almost unfortunate because people with a nuclear power plant in their backyard welcome nuclear but there aren't that many people with a nuclear power plant in their backyard because we simply don't have that many we don't need that many it is that powerful yeah i want to to add up to what you're saying because uh, it, that's not in the U not just in the us you see the same thing in finland that people that live close to either the uh, the uh, the power plants or the repository are very positive same thing you see in um, in sweden they have managed to where they're building their final waste repository in that municipality more than 80% are very positive to that but you also see it actually in norway as well where i come from where we don't have nuclear energy but we had four research reactors and people that live I actually, they, they even live on top of the reactor because it was placed inside a mountain. So people know that they're living on top of a nuclear reactor and they are very, very positive. But also I want to add, because since, since we are talking about um, <coughs> preserving nature and talking about it like, oh, maybe we should do more of this. Actually, in Norway, we see that uh, that is actually the reason why people are becoming more and more positive towards nuclear because they, they really, a lot of Norwegians, they don't want wind turbines in their nature. So when they, s they see these pictures that, I also I think they're pretty beautiful actually, windmills, but a lot of Norwegians get very mad about this. They don't want the wind turbines in their nature because nature is so, and the, 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 the wild nature is so extre extremely important to Norwegians. And this is actually one of the most important reasons why many Norwegians are now positive towards nuclear. Uh, same in Finland, so there are areas in Finland where there's a lot of wind, so there's a lot of wind turbines and in some areas in Finland it's so saturated already that you can't go anywhere without seeing them. And so people are getting a little bit bored <laughs> and frustrated with like, because it's not the same thing as just looking at a pristine forest. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look the same. You, it, to me that's industrial as well. It doesn't look like a, you know, untouched nature at all. Um, I do realize it's an illusion because a lot of our forests are actually used for forestry, so that's not pristine either, but in any case. Um, I also think it's very important to, because like you said, not a lot of people see nuclear plants. It's very important to show what it looks like inside a nuclear plant, what, what it looks like in social media. So what I've, I, I've really appreciated what current Miss America, Grace Stank, is doing, mm -hmm. like visiting different power plants, putting that in social media. And it used to be that you really couldn't get access to nuclear. It was very secretive, like people weren't allowed in the like, waste repositories or inside the nuclear plants. And it was like very strict how you can film there. And I, I've just visited the Oakland Little 3 plant with an Irish film crew that they're making a climate documentary trying to convince people in Ireland where nuclear is banned that, you know, this is a good thing. And I, you know, nowadays I just, you know, call up the, someone in TV, I was like, I have a film crew coming. I was like, yeah, sure, you can get into a reactor hall or whatever. Uh, of course, there's a lot of security measures. But anyway, it's very important to show people what it looks like. And we also did a Climate 2 project with the local organ replanet organization in Finland. And we had YouTube stars visiting Oak Little 3 and yeah. they drove an electric Porsche there. And then they went 
around the plant and the what is really smart what they've done in Oklo that the visitor center is right in the middle of nature and they have the nature path going around the visitor center and so you have the most spectacular view of the plants with the swan swing from the visitor center so that's thing some things that we could be doing and and we are already doing great point Jens Yes, yeah, so I just want to emphasize this point. I think it's really important. Um, I was living in Japan for a couple of months uh, recently, and I when I want I'm a huge nuclear lover, so I wanted to visit their nuclear plant. So I just took the train five hours out in nowhere, and I walked around out there, and I was thrown away by the military because they said you <laughs> cannot be here. Um, and I think it's uh, it's kind of bad for nuclear that there is this thing about it that's really like scary or it's like they're not welcoming the not people welcoming, uh, they're yeah. they're not really like saying hey we have this awesome thing right here come and check it out of, of course the safety needs to be uh, high of course but they should be doing better at like showing what yes. is actually nuclear and I think it was so great to come here to the Emirates and visiting Baraka their new nuclear power plant they were so like proud of what they have out there and welcoming it and we can take pictures and we, we they di it didn't have the same vibe as it has in many other places where it's just you get thrown away by the military if you just like go even near it I think that has to change as our panel slowly draws to a close I'd like to just consolidate the all the points that we heard today and uh, what I see is a huge deficit between the reality of what nuclear can do for climate and the narrative around it. And uh, I think um, it's up to all of us to figure out how to build that narrative bridge and connect um, the love of nature we all, feel, we all feel in our hearts with this technology that we all love as well, but we tend to be more thinking about with our heads. And uh, to build that head-heart connection, uh, that allows us to um, realize that this, uh, the seeming contradiction is not actually co contradiction. That this extremely high-tech, giant facility is actually the tiniest in terms of uh, the pressure and burden it puts on planet Earth. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to open up the floor to any questions that you might have for our panelists. I invite you all to, uh, or even share if you have a personal experience about this or um, something that you'd like to say on this topic. I would really love to hear from you. Anyone? Oh, here we go. Um, when it comes to nuclear waste, um, what do you think are the most you know, um, nature-friendly solutions? Uh, well, um, I, I can say something about waste and, and, and these, these questions. Um, because nuclear waste is something that people ask about, uh, obviously, because as th that is something that has been talked about. Oh, but you have this dangerous waste. And that is true. You, you produce... Uh, you produce waste that should not be come out in nature and we have to take care of it. But that is perhaps also one of those uh, facts about nuclear that might be, uh, might be surprising that the, the energy source that produces the least amount of dangerous waste per kilowatt hour produced <coughs> energy is actually nuclear. So if you are scared of toxic waste, the nuclear is also actually the best. But yeah, you have to have to take care of it, for example, like the, the Finns are doing. So, um, yeah. yeah, so we have a very deep uh, repository underground in Finland that's going to be finished very soon. Um, I don't think we necessarily would need that, to be honest. I mean, no. we could reuse the waste, which is very environmentally friendly, because we could power like some of the the nations that have nuclear for decades, uh, but like just with the waste that we already have, even more. Uh, if we had breeding reactors, so I think that would be the most environmentally friendly solution. But in the meanwhile, I think the solutions we already have are already very environmentally friendly. I mean, nuclear waste hasn't really caused from the power plants. It hasn't caused any like made anything like to the environment basically uh, it's you know we're already taking care of it so that uh, I think it's a problem that's 
has already been solved. And just to, to go a little bit back to the numbers, to what we talk about to, to preserve nature and do least harm to nature, because when, if you talk about the size of the waste, uh, I know, well, I guess that the, the Finnish and the, s the Swedish is more b b roughly roughly the same, because we're talking about that there's huge amounts of waste, and I don't know where this, no where this huge comes from because for example a country like Sweden the entire volume of all their waste that they've produced so far is like a small house small house not a big house a small house that's the entire entire thing and I guess the same for the for Finland that's why they have to build one or either reuse the waste but or build one repository but that's enough you build one and yeah it's no other energy source that does so little harm to nature but of course there will always be a footprint a negative footprint for whatever you do i think the, the last thing to add on that is there's only one source of energy in the history of the world that takes care of its own waste yes. and it's nuclear energy yes. like when you think about fossil fuels obviously you're releasing waste into the air pollution when you think about wind and solar like when you have the wind turbines that are no longer uh, working or the the solar panels, like those go into a, a, a landfill or you need to do something with them. Um, nuclear is the only one that actually gathers its own waste and keeps it either on site or in a geological repository. Um, and most people just don't understand that. They think it, like it goes into the waterways or goes into the air. No, it's like in the US at least, it's kept on site. It's kept in these incredible caskets that are like concrete and steel and the radiation doesn't leak out of it. And it's, it's really quite incredible to think that compared to every other energy source, it's the only one that takes care of its own waste. I wanted to add one thing in general to, to our discussion, because I, I think that may be interesting for you, especially that we are mostly advocates for nuclear here. So uh, I wanted to like remind about the fact that actually some organisms in the nature, they are using radiation right now. <laughs> like there are microorganisms using radiation to like create this metabolic cycle and without radiation it wouldn't be wouldn't be possible and also like we we have fungi which can like produce uh, melanin and because of that it's absolutely resistant for radiation so it's really interesting and uh, actually it's it's the whole rabbit hole which in you can uh, try to jump but it's something that we forget about Man, in many ta many cases, and I think it's quite important, especially in this public communication. Uh, yeah, I. Oh, here's another question. Let's uh, get this gentleman over here. So more more a comment than a question. That's okay. Um, so even the U.S. military understands what we've been talking about here. So I served in the submarine force, and the Navy takes families to sea on the submarines for an afternoon or for a day, and they get to experience what their, the crew members that they're married to or their moms or dads experience. So it's a complete demystification of that. And it goes exactly, especially to your point, but I think you all have referred to this. The demystification is a key to changing the narrative and the image that people have. All right, one more question or comment. Thank you. Maybe I can build on this. Um, do you believe the question is? Uh, do you believe, like, for some political reasons, the expansion of nuclear uh, uh, electricity uh, has been limited uh, for like control and uh, and security issues? Would you believe in this or not? Can you rephrase the question again? Do you think that the expansion of nuclear power has been limited due to political choices and decisions? Political choices and decisions. Okay, let's go to our panelists. Uh, Jan, yeah, let's, uh, let's hear from Jan. Yes, I actually believe it has. Um, so I can only talk about my own country, Denmark, but I know that this degrowth ideology has actually been quite present in the political spectrum of our country. Um, so, what they believe is that a lot of energy is actually a bad thing because it, because right now energy production has a huge negative impact on our planet. They couple that 
with uh, nuclear energy and say mm. like if we have an enormous amount of energy that must have a negative impact on the planet uh, so they have actually made nuclear illegal in Denmark like um, so yeah I think they have been limiting nuclear energy because it is such a powerful uh, tool to get a, a large amount of energy and they unfortunately make that link between energy consumption and negative impact whereas nuclear is like free from all of that nuclear energy just does not have this negative impact yeah before we take another question i just want to confirm so their logic is nuclear is so powerful that we use more of it we'll just end up like using more energy instead of saying wait we c it's so powerful we can use less land so that's screwy to me, but there you go, degrowth. Hi, uh, um, I'm Jonas. Well, I'm with you guys. I'm from the Netherlands. I want to strongly disagree with what you said. And I think the uh, orders in the other way around. I think that the historical reason why people have opposed nuclear, which is no longer relevant now, but it has been an uh, association with nuclear weapons. You know, mm -hmm. nuclear weapons as the original sin of technology, um, a fear of the word nuclear and uh, yeah a mixing of the two and uh, uh, that's what led to many bans and I think degrowth came after the rejection of nuclear so if you have this you know powerful tool out of your toolbox uh, the challenge becomes much more difficult and then you're not thinking about solutions anymore you're thinking oh no but maybe our demand for energy is a sin not our rejection of nuclear well, yeah um, so I don't think we disagree that much actually when you think about it because I Both think the emphasizing the fear about nuclear weapons and linking that with nuclear energy I think that was done on purpose because they wanted to not have nuclear for several reasons and one of the major reasons they did not want it was just because it could make humanity so prosperous and grow so much with so much energy and I think they used a lot of like tools to make nuclear energy um, like not be a thing and I think they use like the fear of nuclear weapons for that reason I have talked with many like older people from Denmark and it is this degrowth ideology they just don't want humanity to grow anymore they think that we have reached the limit of growth because it had has uh, it, it has had a negative impact on the planet but as I said before like nuclear energy does not have these things like we can grow yes. without harming the planet with nuclear I have a funny anecdote so I heard this very deep green environmental say that it's like giving a lollipop to a kid yeah. nuclear energy ah, it's too nice too nice it's too, too rewarding we, we, we cannot be allowed to responsibly handle it because we are we are too greedy instead of saying actually we need this powerful energy so that we can use less resources and uh, we're almost about to round up I uh, will ask our uh, um, panelists for any final thoughts yeah so when it comes to, to changing this narrative and sort of in engaging the audience and I think we've had a very nice discussion I mean this is a big question but I want to say one thing that is uh, at least uh, as a region slightly in politically correct and that is that we need more uh, women especially young women I think to talk about who are working somehow with this industry or in this uh, scientific community to to get out there and do it in your own way not try to be I mean if you are yeah I, I think we need even more we need more people but especially uh, women and young women All right, and uh, unless there are any other final thoughts, um, Christian? I was just going to say one, one last thing is most people here agree, and, and that's great, but, but at the same time that's also problematic because we need the people out there in the real world to agree with us as well. And so I think the takeaway that I have from this, when we all go back to our different countries, five different countries represent six actually with the moderator, is we need to be using more cool photos for nuclear need to be using more animals, more nature, um, and make this visually something people can relate to. Because nobody looks at a cooling tower and says, oh, I relate to that. But if you have an image of the wolves or the swans or the cool forests around the nuclear plant, that's what people relate to. And we need to all go, out, go back to our own countries and make sure that people in the real world, not at COP in the real world, understand this. 
And in addition to that, in the real world, we should start also, maybe not start, but we should work with the kids to yes. show them, not like the, give them the knowledge or the facts like that. Show them how to get this, these facts. Show them to be cur curious. Show them to ask questions. I think it's really important in general, but especially in terms of science, we need to show them that science is, is great and they should be curious. They should ask questions and they should have that them. is a great final note to end on. It is too late for the old people. Let's go after the kids. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> no, but absolutely. I think um, the real message is um, everything starts with a vision. Everything starts with con reconciling the reality we know with um, a narrative that we can connect with the world. It so. Uh, the panel's ended. Uh, please reach out to our panelists. We're still around to chat. And I, I challenge all of you to go out there and spread this message. Thank you very much.